Top Bed Talk. I'm Monty Mython. Welcome to the Transatlantic Leadership Forum. And I'm delighted to be chairing that with Desiree Chappell, who you've met in a few earlier sessions. So we represent a transatlantic component here. Yeah. We've chosen to go for the concept of having a same day knee replacement, an operation that certainly when we were introducing enhanced recovery in the UK, we were trying to get the length of stay down below a week and in some places down below two weeks. And now we're talking about getting it down to a day. So, and the question there is, is that going too far, too hard, if you see me? Well, for today, we've chosen so-called connected health. And I'll read you out a, a definition of that from Wikipedia in the moment, or at least a, a little snippet of it. Uh, but first, I'm going to ask Desiree to, to reintroduce herself and then for her to tell us about our panel and bring them up to say hello. Well, thank you, Monty. I am co-chair of this. I work with Monty on Top Men Talk. I'm managing editor for that. I'm a CRNA, a certified registered nurse anesthetist from the U.S., and I'm vice president of clinical quality for North Star Anesthesia. So I have almost as many titles as Monty does now, which is exciting. So <laughs> we do have our panel. Let's get to them. First, we have joining us uh, John Whittle, who is a consultant anesthetist, critical care physician and perioperative medicine physician at University College London and honorary associate professor of perioperative medicine. John Whittle, it is wonderful to see you and America misses you. Thanks Desiree, <laughs> it's lovely to see you too and I miss America. But, uh, <laughs> I'm sure you do. It's uh, a good place to be. <laughs> As you say, I'm all those things, currently based at uh, University College Hospital clinically in London, a nice North London location and UCL academically. Uh, up until last year, I was in Duke, North Carolina for three years, having trained in the UK before that. So I've got a little bit of experience both sides of the pond and still a foot on each side. That's right. And definitely in the space of perioperative medicine and hope to hear more about that in just a little bit. Next, we have Imogen Fetcher Jones. She is the lead nurse for perioperative services at University Southampton Hospital. Imogen. Hi there. So, yeah, as you said, I'm the lead nurse for perioperative medicine and pre assessment at University Hospital Southampton. I'm fortunate enough to work for a truly fantastic team, the Prof. Mike Rocott, Denny Levitt, and Sandy Jack. I'm really just such a privilege to work with them and part time academic fellow with a particular interest in patient education and behavior change. Next up, we have Betty Jo Rocchio. She is a CRNA like myself from the US. She is also Senior Vice President and System Chief Nursing Officer for Mercy Health in the US. Thank you for having me. I've spent my entire career up until the last two years pretty much in the perioperative space. So I'm currently in my role as the Chief Nursing Officer of a 45 hospital system in the United States. Um, perioperative services still reports up through me and it is really my true love. I still do a little bit of anesthesia activity and when you look at most of the innovative things that are coming out of our health system, um, a lot of them come out of our perioperative areas. So it's a pleasure to be with you today. Fantastic. We also have uh, Sam Ajizian, who is the CMO for Patient Monitoring, Vice President of Global Clinical Research and Medical Science for Patient Monitoring and Respiratory Interventions for Medtronic. Sam, it's wonderful to see you again. Hi, everyone around the world. It's really, ex I'm really excited to be on this morning and representing industry as a key partner to, to our needs to take care of patients. Uh, in and around the operating room environment. So uh, my background is as a pediatric intensive care doc. Uh, I spent most of my career at Wake Forest University down the road from Duke in North Carolina, where I still live. And I've been with Medtronic now uh, six and a half years. In my current role, uh, help inform strategy for a global patient monitoring business that provides, you know, sentinel technology that is foundational for the care of, of our patients uh, across the care spectrum. So happy again to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. And lastly, we have Neil Johnson. He's the CEO at Monty. Help me here because I am not Irish. Croy? Croy, well, yeah, probably asked Neil. Johnson That's right. Neil, join correctly. us and tell us more about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't no, want to mess good, it up. Very good. Very good effort. I have to say, yes, delighted to be here. My name is Neil Johnson and um, I'm here at Monty's invitation and I, I appreciate the opportunity and I guess I'm here in, in the capacity as a patient advocate representative, if you like. I run three actual not-for-profits just based up the road from where you are. I'm in Galway, the true capital of the West of Ireland. <laughs> Those three entities, one is a regional heart and stroke foundation called Cree. So it's Cree rather than Croy, but it's an Irish, a Gaelic word for heart. 
The second entity is a national entity. It's a national institute for prevention and cardiovascular health. And that's also based here in our heart and stroke center. And the third uh, entity, uh, which I guess I got to meet Monty through, is the Global Heart Hub. And the Global Heart Hub is a relatively new entity. It's an umbrella organization of heart patient organizations. And I guess our mission here is to try and create a united voice and create a platform for those living with cardiovascular disease. Despite the scale and burden of cardiovascular disease, it's hard to believe that the patient voice actually isn't organized. And this is what the uh, Global Heart Club is all about. I'm going to read a look, opening part of the definition here from Wikipedia, looking up connected health, because I think it's a word we've learned to bandy around, but it means different things to different people. So here in Wiki, so it must be true, it says connected health is a socio-technical model for healthcare management and delivery by using technology to provide healthcare services remotely. It goes on to say, you know, it, it can be used different terms, but basically it comes down to flexible opportunities for consumers to engage with clinicians and better self-manage their care. And further, it says it uses readily available consumer technologies to deliver patient care outside of the hospital or doctor's office. So we're gonna ask you to make a, a comment about connected health from your perspective. And as part of that, whether you think there's been an impact from COVID-19, you know, has COVID-19 put Connected Health into hyperdrive or is that suggestion all hype? As part of that, if you choose, you can give, give an example, but there's no pressure on from that perspective. Desiree. Yeah. John Whittle is at first John. Perspective. Yes. <laughs> yes is the answer. So there's been a whole bunch of problems that have come as a result of COVID, you know, patient flow in the hospital, green, blue, red, whatever colours you want to call the pathways, full hospitals, full waiting lists, expanding waiting lists at our hospital and region. So I guess one of the main issues that we've had is how we can connect with our patients without their physical presence. So that's spread across a variety of spaces. So for example, pre-assessment, you know, moving to models of remote pre-assessment, uh, video links, etc. There's a prehabilitation service, for example, that we're setting up here at UCLH, which is going to have to leverage technology really to reach our patients, to help engage them. So really this connected health concept is really accelerating plans that we had on the back burner, but are, um, are coming to the fore now. So Imogen, what's your perspective? COVID has really enabled us to make Connected Health a reality. I think we all had aspirations five years ago, certainly. So I developed the surgery school at Southampton in the UK, and we were running a face-to-face -face education session for patients pre-COVID and, and patients liked it. And, you know, it was going really well, but we knew it wasn't quite hitting the mark in that our attendance wasn't as good as it could have been and we knew that people were struggling to get to the hospital and the usual issues with parking etc and there also was a bit of a social demographic with that as well that concerned us but had covid come along i'm i don't know that we ever would have managed what we have in the last year in that we just totally flipped it online and are now delivering an intervention um, completely online remotely to patients mixed surgical bag we've seen over 500 now in the last year and the feedback we're getting from patients. It's blown me away, to be honest, because I didn't expect it to be as popular as an online intervention as it is. But not only is it popular, our attendance has gone up, and also more patients are reporting to us that they're intending to change their behaviour. So it actually appears to be more effective, which I never would have believed pre-COVID. So I'm totally for the hyperdrive. <laughs> Betty Jo, how about you transatlantically? What's it looking like in the US? <laughs> Well, so we were fortunate enough in Mercy, we had a virtual hospital already before COVID started. But what it did for us is really amplify the role of nursing and physicians working together through that telehealth platform. And so we moved as much as we could into that platform and take advantage of not only pre-surgical visits, but post-surgical visits that couldn't occur in the doctor's office because while we shut down surgery for a very small time during COVID, we ramped up very quickly, but weren't quite ready to go straight back into the doctor's offices. So we moved a ton of that work into that environment. So as well as connecting it for our emergency department. So instead of admitting those COVID patients that could handle it, we sent them home with the appropriate therapies and the appropriate technology to be able to monitor them with COVID. So I think we're fortunate in the U.S. to be ahead of that curve and very fortunate in Mercy uh, because that platform already existed. We just literally threw it into hyperdrive um, to take advantage of the situation. Um, and we're partnering with um, SAM and Medtronic and 
other vendors to make sure that the technology is keeping up um, and truly providing the experience that the patients need through connected care. So I'm a big fan of it. Um, nursing is participating on every level in it um, and looking forward to moving it forward after COVID as well. Fantastic. Well, Sam, your your perspective and and kind of role kind of role in all this. Yeah, thanks, Desiree. So, you know, as I said, we're a monitoring business, and I think we all understand that that COVID maybe hyperdrives a little bit of hyperbole, um, but uh, it certainly has ignited some sort of telemedicine and remote monitoring revolution. I think we'll look back in ten years and say, "Wow, that's really when things ramped up and changed." And as uh, an intensivist who really does not take care of patients outside of the hospital, we have to realize that in many, many developed areas of the world, the complexity around medical decision making, absent of the patient being in front of you, is increasing and will continue to increase. And when that intersects with less staffing on wards, less people going into critical care, we have a real duty as one of the leading device makers to make sure that we expand into these areas with medical grade devices that are uncompromising in the kind of information that we're used to getting, but also devices that aid in workflow. In other words, sometimes in the hospital, we're very good at buying something and then we need to hire four other people to help run the program around it. What we're really focusing on here going forward is monitoring patients with meaningful physiologic data without creating a set of ICU patients on the board of the cardiology clinic um, that are being monitored at home. So we're working very closely. I've visited many, many um, uh, hospital systems and stakeholders around the United States. And while Betty Jo's uh, uh, experience represents one, there are as many use cases for this kind of technology as we can think of. Even different use cases within the same hospital on different floors, for example, transitioning patients to home. So I think we're catching up in many ways with the rest of our digital lives, being connected like this and having meetings like this. There's no reason this shouldn't continue in medicine, but we have to honor the fact that there's a technological gap um, in getting physiologic data that's predictive, preventive and allows us to act earlier in the pathophysiologic signature of a condition or disease. So it's an exciting time to be in the monitoring business. And I think uh, we'll see this business transforming uh, tremendously as we provide better care for our patients in that outpatient, remote, telehealth, sphere, whatever we call it. Thank you, Sam. And lastly, Neil, to Imogen's point earlier about patients really enjoying the experience and utilizing this more as patient advocate, tell us about the perspective from that, because I'm sure that they feel that it may be hyperdrive and is it too fast or not? I might answer this question from the, from the Irish perspective. And there's no question we all realize we're living in a consumer-oriented health evolution. And so connected health, telemedicine, all of that is here to stay for sure. And it brings lots of benefits to both patient and clinician and to the health service. You take COVID and probably the biggest immediate impact would have been in the context of virtual consultations. I remember hearing in the early days, some of the cardiology specialists saying how fantastic it was. They were able to now see four times more patients in their clinics. And that's very well, and that's good, but it's not all rosy in the garden. Just because you're seeing four times more patients doesn't necessarily mean that you're delivering four times better care. And what is the experience like from the patient point of view? This was something that was foisted upon them rather suddenly. And again, in a West of Ireland uh, context, and you can draw the analogy to you know, other parts of the world, we had uh, considerations like access, for example, to even mobile technology, worse again, access to Wi-Fi. And then you have given cardiovascular disease, predominantly a condition of the older population, not being used to having conversations with somebody like a clinician on a Zoom call or on, on our mobile phone, and then maybe relying on a son or a daughter to make that connection. And then the son or daughter is there in the room and you're having this conversation, and then you can't discuss certain things that you might want to discuss that are maybe sensitive or whatever. So um, it's, it's um, it, it, interestingly, what has come out of this for us as a patient organization here in Ireland, we've actually started to train patients uh, how to use technology 
and how to engage in those virtual consultations mm -hmm. and how to get comfortable with the technology. Practical issues like how to turn on the Zoom yeah. uh, call and, and, and get connected and then how to feel comfortable in that environment. So sure, it came at us like a runaway train. It brought about huge efficiencies in certain ways, like as I mentioned, the volume of appointments and so forth. But there's a lot of work still to be done. And from a patient point of view, a lot of consultation is required between patient and clinician to understand, are we really achieving what we need to achieve in this clinical relationship? Are you satisfied with this? You know, if you look at it from that point of view. So positive, but a lot of things are still to be considered. Neil, you touched on the access side of it, because we do have a risk here from the point of view of while we wait for a, to catch up and to enable everybody to get appropriate you know, internet and Wi-Fi access, we, we could leave some people behind again, which we, we've tended to do irrespective of the economy in the past. Is that being discussed with dangerous territory now? Is that being discussed at sort of national level? Is there any discussion about assigning some of the healthcare budget to enable everybody? Or you know, th These are complex discussions, but we certainly had some of that in the UK. Well, yeah. No, no obvious public debate on this, Monty, would mm. be the answer. Certainly a lot of discussion about this in the patient community. Mm. I mean, we, we, we have a proportion of the population that are still analog. So, uh, and, then, and then you, you, you and then the Wi-Fi issue. I don't know what it's like down in Kerry, but it's very patchy up here in the West Coast of Ireland. Well, Skellig um, has great, so, great here. <laughs> great Wi-Fi, yeah. So it's, it's um, and I'm sure it's the same across the world. So. You're absolutely right. This is something that needs to be considered because this is here for the, for, the or for the future. I think some countries and some economies, we certainly had somebody trying to get elected who was proposing that it should be a bit more like the roads, if you sort of mean that you should make them go everywhere and you should take the competitive element out of it such that everybody could have sort of some level of connectivity. Now, you didn't seem to win a lot of votes for that one, but that was pre-COVID. I think there might be a few more votes in it now, but it's, uh, it's complicated because of all the other, yeah. you know, the commercial elements to it. Anyway, Neil, I think we, sh we should bring some more people back in on that. From the U.S. perspective, just bring uh, Betty Jo in for a moment. I know Mercy Health, you are located in St. Louis or Missouri, is that right? Yes, correct. So Midwest, it was there are a lot of country out there and uh, may not have access. Did you find that difficult in your experience? It was difficult. You know, in some of our rural areas in the Midwest, even internet's an issue, right? And so, how do we overcome that infrastructure on the internet, right? Not let alone the technology. You know, we're going to have to look at technology that makes it easier. And how do we get around that internet issue? You know, they we know that they have cell service in most places. Um, and so how do we develop out that infrastructure to make sure that, you know, the people that need it can get it or get to a place where they can get it. So probably our areas that could use it most, you know, Internet was an issue. And then the technology is a huge, it's a huge issue. It has to be simple and it has to go from hospital to home back to hospital if we need it. So that's really where we're focusing these days. And then I was going to ask Imogen as well, you know, just having that reported data from the patients, what was that experience like? Uh, for those patients, I, they might have enjoyed it, but did you, and you said you actually had more uptake on utilization and seeing more patients. Did you find that there was also the struggle with connectivity? Yeah, no, there definitely was. I mean, I think in the UK, we're pretty lucky in that only, I think 8% of the population don't have access to the internet, which is, and that was 2020, and I think it's probably even gone up because of COVID. But having said that, there were lots of troubles with people that had the equipment at home, but didn't have the confidence to use it. And it could take half an hour to get somebody online, which is obviously manpower, one-to-one -one conversation. So actually as an intervention, it's quite resource intensive, even though it is remote. And in some cases, patients did just get frustrated and couldn't join or ended up leaving halfway through because their internet cut out, which obviously we were then able to follow them up. But I mean, we haven't got it quite right yet and we've got some ideas for improving it, but definitely there's other way to go. There's probably a lot of resources that need to go to the people utilizing this technology and teaching them. And, and Sam, probably from that perspective, that's something that you guys are, are all in, huh? Definitely. I mean, look at the last big digital thing we did in medicine, the electronic medical record. And I think if we could all turn back time as practitioners, we probably would not do a lot of the things the same way. And I think it's a great lesson for us that the next digital revolution has got to create value around our workflow as practitioners. So all the things we're hearing about connectivity and person power to, to coach 
folks through connecting and things like that can be ameliorated in many ways by technology. If we have human factors friendly devices that are getting passive information without bothering the patient at all, connected through a cell network, because most people have cell, uh, can get cell service uh, easier than they can Wi-Fi. If we can close those gaps and transmit that data without the patient even being involved, if we're just screening and monitoring, that really gets rid of a lot of workflow. And that takes places where caregivers are not giving care and gives them time to go out and see a patient who's remote, for example, or even on a med surge ward can empower a nurse to have less work in charting and actually spend more time with their patient. So I think it's incumbent on us as leaders in the field, all of us, to, to make sure that we enter into this with very careful attention to workflow improvement. John, I wanted to talk to you about your experience because you know what you do in some of the testing and prehabilitation. How does that work when you actually do need to physically see a patient? You know, is there still a, a space for this? Yeah, so it's complicated. So I recognize everything that's been said so far, this issue with patients either not having easy access to technology or if they have access to it, uh, not being able to use it. So there's an education piece there, both at a uh, national and local level. I mean, locally, we are attempting to uh, overcome some of those problems. So for example, peer education or use of family members to help patients get online with some of the tools that we're developing, providing some of the equipment for the patients, so for example, tablets or wearables as part of a an order around the whole prehabilitation process, i.e. facilitating it as much as possible for the patient. But there will still be, there is this equity issue, which will be hard to overcome. Other aspects that are interesting and difficult and thorny, how we use data, how we share data. So using you know, machine learning tools, AI, etc., to interpret patterns in patients' data, often that will be outsourced to larger companies. And I'm, I'm sure many people are aware of some of the discussion around, for example, Google in the last couple of years with health data and their cloud platforms. I, I mean, I think personally, I think this is the way that, you know, we can facilitate workflow and so on, but it's a big debate which needs to encompass all stakeholders. But I think overall, it is a necessity. We have to move to these connected health solutions to improve workflow, to improve patient care, and actually in the end to maximize reach, if anything. The counter to this uh, problem is that actually our patients often referred in from a long distance away. Uh, so we can't physically get them into the hospital as often as we'd like to in order to administer or, or to engage in therapies uh, that re require rapid uh, or, or regular input. Well, I do, you know, speaking of connectedness, the way we're asking questions during our virtual meeting is through Slido. So if you do have any questions, please do enter that into Slido. If you're on your computer, it's very easy. It's just to the right of the stage. If you are on another device, it's slido.com event code IC2021. So please do ask questions. Monty, so, thoughts? So I was getting, you, you please do choose who to direct it to first, Desiree, but I was going to ask if you do get pushback, recurring themes from the projects that you're involved with, what's either the biggest or the most common set of pushbacks that you get? I think we've touched on some of them, but I'd just like to, to, to revisit that. Yeah, Betty Jo, how about you start us off on that one? It is some of the pushbacks we get are around the technology, making sure that family members get included into some of this. So how are family members able to be present during like the video type of visit? And then how do nurses reach out on an everyday basis to make sure that we're providing care? Some of these people still need nursing care. Um, it just has to be virtual. So it's that physician nurse collaboration that goes on in the hospitals, trying to figure out what that collaboration looks like out of that home environment or not in the standard care environment. And so those are probably three of the biggest things that we're up against other than the technology, Sam said, being able to keep up with where we want to go. And Imogen, I know that the, the patient population that you're working with, I mean, there are a lot of elderly I know cancer has been some of that work and some of these other cases, that, those, that's a very difficult population to get to. Some of the pushback we've had is around confidentiality. Funnily enough, they're, they're happy to sit in a room with each other and, and share information about themselves. But when you put them on a, a Teams call or you know a, a Zoom call, they, they suddenly get very shy. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, and that's a shame because we've lost a bit of interactivity and the peer support that we used to get through our group. So we're working at ways that we can increase that. But also from a, a staffing perspective, on some of our other projects that we've been working on with Connected Health, I still think that even after the pandemic and areas that are just now moving on to more virtual methods or now COVID's finished, oh gosh, this is going to be the future. There still is a little bit of a reluctance to change and a confidence you know, to do things online, you might be a nurse practitioner that works really confidently in the room with a patient that you can examine and you can see every part of. But there's a slight worry that I get from some of my team about, well, I just don't feel I'm doing a proper job doing it virtually online and it doesn't sit well with all of them. So I think, you know, it's just a change process that we're gradually just going to have to work through. John, similar experience? Yeah, we have a big variability in older patients. You can't just assume that older patients can't use technology. I think that's also the wrong approach. Data confidentiality issue uh, exists at both ends of the spectrum. We're asked a lot of questions our end in terms of governance and risk assessments with regards to employing these new technologies. We've had to do a lot of education around how to include families, as uh, Beth Joe mentioned, in these discussions. So. For example, most of my life as an intensive care physician, having the family liaison team working out how to bring in various patients. In fact, we've had to have dedicated technology savvy individuals who are just there to bring patients and families and clinicians together. So it is a new way of working. And finally, yeah, this for me, it was a massive surprise how much it already exists in the US with regards to, you know, remote care, intensive care. Again, I'm thinking of in particular these ideas of sort of sitting in front of screens and looking at multiple patients and interacting remotely, that takes an adaption. We all want to go and, you know, touch the patient's foot or <laughs> feel their pulse or whatever. So the generation coming through will be more familiar with it than maybe I am. <laughs> yeah. But Sam, you know, we've had some conversation about this and through COVID, a lot of the remote <coughs> monitoring really was in hyperdrive, wasn't it? It was, but it was sort of existing technologies mm. to the home, right? And then the creation of, of a hospital and home environment in which what they're missing are nursing and respiratory colleagues seeing the patients. So while that was done, and, and some used, you know, wearables, if patients had wearables, even commercial grade wearables, or over the counter pulse oximetry that folks were buying in drugstores. So there was, you know, because of the pandemic and the intensity and the lack of resources on the inpatient side, we were forced as a profession to adjust. That adjustment is the lighting of the field of telemedicine. It's not likely to be a long term solution to manage my mother with an over count pulse oximeter from somewhere when on an O2 dependent CPD patient. I think when we have medical ownership of those patients as providers, we want to ensure that the data coming in is, is accurate and we're making good decisions. The thing missing right now, is the one device that can do it all, human factors friendly format, design format that is easily connected and can be manipulated to do what the providers need to do um, from a remote setting. So the good news here is there's a tremendous amount of investment by many hospital systems in the US and around the world in remote patient monitoring. You know, as critical care providers and anesthesia providers, we think of monitoring as stuff connected to our patients that goes to a box, spits out numbers that we use. Monitoring is many different things. When a nurse call system to do calls for your post-op patients at home, that's monitoring and you're spending millions of dollars doing. It. So people are already spending. We think that by adding affordable technology that's friendly, we can empower this, as John said, with some AI-driven early predictive modeling that could really help us intervene before our patients end up back in the ER or God forbid, back in the hospital. Neil, does all this sound familiar to you of, of things that you hear back from the patients? Absolutely. There was reference earlier to, you know, workflow. I should have uh, exampled um, during COVID, for example, in Ireland, virtually uh, cardiac rehabilitation virtually shut down because of the, you know, inability to have face-to-face -face engagement. And um, we were actually one of the a uh, few places in the country that delivered uh, a cardiac rehabilitation program remotely. And I mean, this was very successful. The model was referral and then participants on a remote program for 10 or 12 weeks. So there's huge benefits, as we can see on the pushback piece. It was alluded to already that 
when you start to do introduce the remote technologies, there's a greater investment required at, you, at, at the clinician end as well as at the patient end. So when we were setting up those cardiac rehabilitation programs, we spent multiples of extra hours just getting the patients online and comfortable and so forth. And that takes time. Equally, you know, on the question of remote monitoring, obviously there was a big push to push out monitors where they were available and have patients hook up to them and, uh, you know, have their, their data transferred. And apart from the data, tra- the data privacy issues, one of the things patients obviously always talk about is who is seeing this and who is acting on it and how quickly are they acting on it? And of course, one of the things is that if you're not properly set up, you have increased the number of people feeding information in, but at the other end, is there enough resource there to you know, actually manage that data and respond to it in a timely fashion? So these are the sort of things that patients are talking about and asking about. We have a couple of questions that have come in. The first one, is technology going to make the doctor redundant? Sam. <laughs> a- absolutely not. Absolutely not. What we have to work for as a group, and again, this is industry and providers and patient groups, is to look at the practice of medicine in a different way as the future evolves. We've got to empower our overworked providers with information that allows them to practice medicine and to practice nursing, not create more distance between the patient and the physician. So it may look a little different, may not be feeling pulses and checking cap refill on telemedicine calls, but we should have objective physiologic data that helps empower our decision-making in a little bit different way. Betty Joe, what about you? Does this affect nursing? I think it is going to affect nursing. You know, we're struggling, at least in the United States, with a national nursing shortage. In the next year or so, we're looking at being about a million nurses short in this country. So when you think about that, it's mainly in the inpatient care environment. And so that really clears up if we can use technology not to replace nurses, um, but to make that collaboration between physician and nurses um, be seen just a little bit differently and kind of predict or prescribe certain actions, but it still needs that critical thinking of a nurse or a physician working together. But can we do it more efficiently? And so we're not teasing out individual pieces of data to make a plan of care, but the plan of care is prescribed based off of past data sets and the prediction into the future. I think that's gonna help us out a ton. And when you look at RPA, AI, combining those makes perfect sense for physicians and nurses. Um, It's how we're gonna do it that's gonna matter um, and whether we gain efficiency. So I think we have to stay on top of this, but it's not gonna replace us, um, but it is gonna help us be better and more efficient. We have another one here. In the pre-op assessment optimization, have you experienced the need to cancel or alter surgery where condition slash status was unreliably assessed through telemed? Now, we did an interview recently, Desiree, where it was the opposite that was reported. Uh, Let's see. Imogen, how about you? You've had a lot of experience in this. I mean, anecdotally, we are are getting cancellations, uh, very late cancellations, but more to do with the the recovery of our services than the fact that we're seeing the patients more remotely, to be honest, and the fact that we've lost a lot of our pre-assessment nursing staff and we can't get through the volume of patients that we used to be able to, so it's all very last minute. I I can't think of a single episode where you could actually put it down to the fact that the patient was seen virtually and not in person, to be honest. Joe, how about you guys um, in this experience over the last year and a half? Do you feel like, there? Th- I guess you started the virtual hospital before COVID. Did you feel like, you know, there are patients that slip through the cracks? Not really. We have a pretty good system since it started before COVID. It was organized for how patients got into the virtual program and out of it. What I would say is we ramped it up more into our clinic offices. And what we saw there on the, you know, physician office or clinic side was um, a learning curve for those physicians to go virtual with their visits, right? So that's really where we saw patients kind of slip through was in that outpatient setting. But that home-to-home environment was set up nicely. We had all the technology set up to be delivered. So we didn't see many slip through the cracks there. I'm going to address, if I may, a, a tension that I've perceived. In other words, during COVID, we managed to shift a lot of activities away from the traditional acute hospital setting. So a lot of outpatient clinics worked out possibly they didn't need as much real estate as they've invested in. 
and there's all that travel and all of that parking and all of those days off, are we going to feel a pressure to reinstate that because some people are in the business of hospitals and outpatients and parking and they've built a model that requires people to turn up? Who would you like to start with that one? Uh, let's see, John Whittle, what about you? What are your thoughts on that? Number one, it's, you know, my first observation would be that this isn't really about tech versus human. This is sort of tech and human. Um, so there are some bits of medicine that still require uh, at all times, really, a physical uh, human interaction. The actual operation at the moment still requires a human to be in the room, um, at least one. <laughs> and then and then there's the surgeons as well. With regards to clinic rooms, clinic assessments, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, probably familiar, Monty, with the, the Centre for Perioperative Care document that came out, uh, you know, a month or two later. I think you might have had something to do with it, where the suggestion was uh, that we should use tech where possible to enable reductions in, in hospital real estate to facilitate uh, patient throughput to consider single day operations where possible in the perioperative space etc but not to replace or refine or, or, or you know or reduce um, actual in-person care so we'll find a balance it's so complicated. And patients, will, <laughs> and patients will physically have to be seen in person as well as remotely. And as we go around, John, I think we may find that it depends on the healthcare economy that you work in. Because in the mm -hmm. National Health Service, as we've often talked about, for 85% of the healthcare we provide in the United Kingdom, more work is just more work. So if you can manage to get people out of the outpatients, everyone's celebrating. Whereas if you happen to be in the business of renting space in outpatients, it's bad business to, to not get people into outpatients, possibly. But we'll continue the conversation. Well, well I was going to ask Sam, just from the, the perspective of the U.S., because I know you work with multiple hospital systems. I mean, what are the thoughts there? Yeah, as much as we want this to be a genius, easy-to-solve landscape, I, I agree with John. Uh, it is, is as different from place to place as you can imagine. The key thing for us is, as uh, a large device company is to understand the landscape of uses for everything is going to be changing. You know, you'll see some systems realize that 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 real estate, if you will, could be used differently. And maybe we can expand access to some patients who are not getting seen who need to. I think that it's going to evolve. There's tension there and there's going to have to be a balance. I think, again, we just have to have the technology that can be used in, in all of these possible instruments to empower patient access to caregivers. Betty Joe, from your perspective, because I would imagine that you have both outpatient and inpatient facilities and you're having to work the balance of those. How, how does that work? What is the financial you know, piece of that? Well, it's interesting. It's not only you know, adding in virtual, but it's also payment systems. Mm. So when you look at how <laughs> people were paid, during COVID, we got special incentives to go virtual, right? We were allowed to do that. We opened up license restrictions, right, for physicians and nurses being able to work across states. All that drives, especially in Mercy when we're in four states, how we deploy virtual care. But I think what you can't do is give up on it. I think you've got to keep, we've got to keep pushing the boundaries and move our government and legislators to the point that they see that this is not going to slow down. It's only going to pick up. And here's the reasons why. And it does deliver better health care done right. And for our patients, when you're looking at being consumer centric, it's about, I hate to say it, stereotypical. Our younger generation would do everything online, right? They try to have their gallbladder out on, you know, through a video camera. Um, look at where we've gone for perioperative services. They will do anything online. But, you know, some of our, not all, but some of our older generations like that physical contact with their doctor, right? And so they're never going to be happy with the video um, visit. So I think what you're going to have to do is keep dancing in that ballroom with everything in play while you're heading to the door where you see it moving. How fast you dance to that door um, depends on your geographic location and the government and payer system kind of backing us up. So you've got to be in both areas though. Um, and to Sam's point, I think the technology has to keep up with us so when we're ready to move, we're ready to go. So I think it's a lot of factors in play. And Jen, what about you? What are your thoughts on that from your perspective? I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I would say we need more space. I mean, we, with our team, Peroptive Medicine in Southampton, we're a little bit a victim of our own success, really, in that 
um, it's taken off. We've, we've showed what we can do um, with patients. And now with the massive waiting list, it's like, well, can you do it with another 1,000, 2,000 patients that you weren't seeing at that point, but can you see them now? So yeah, we need more space than ever, I would say, because even if the appointments are virtual, you still need a room to do that in. The clinician is still in there on a computer. But actually, it's it has was thinking that there have been some situations where actually we've been benefited from the fact that some services are not requiring so much space and then we are, are acquiring it. So <laughs> actually, yeah, we were setting up a whole new iron service down in the New Forest off the back of the fact that the maternity little suite there has been vacated. So yeah, we're, we're doing lots of land grab at the moment just to, to see as many patients as we can, virtually or otherwise, really. Yeah, that's great. And then, Neil, from the Irish perspective, what's, what's happening here? How to put it, it's probably a positive thing in the sense that um, in our system, and, and I, I guess the same in, in, in a lot of countries, is that hospitals need to get back to being what they were meant to be, which is centres for care of the acutely ill. And so there, are, there have been and are so many unnecessary admissions and attendances at hospitals that actually this is an opportunity to sort of sort the the men from the boys, so to speak, and, 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 and move what can be done in secondary care into secondary care. And if then you have more space in the hospital to do the more acute care and uh, procedures, then that's surely good from patient point of view. One more question here. Does telemedicine practicing virtual medicine or technology usage in pandemic, this is from Mari Mariha, I think, um, I apologize if I'm correcting your name incorrectly, it says here declining the burnout syndrome in medical practitioners or maybe not. I think what the question relates to is, do you think that it, it's helped, the telemedicine side of it has helped reduce some of the burnout issues during COVID? Imogen, how about you? Let's start with you. I think it's probably added to it. I don't know. Perhaps it's just because we're new to it and there's a learning curve, but I'd much rather be in a room with a patient chatting. I'd find that a lot less hard work than being online. You know, it is intense. I think we've all done so many virtual meetings now that you, you it drains you doesn't it having to just sort of sit there and concentrate on what you're doing it's different to being in a room so for me at the moment it's probably slightly added to my burnout levels but you know <laughs> everyone's different <laughs> yeah sure. Sam what are you hearing from um you know here in the U.S. and as someone who promotes technology I agree with Imogen burnout is rampant I think any form of work right now that is additive particularly when it adds more responsibility, which we all assume, whether I'm seeing you this way or I'm seeing you in the ICU, uh, can can contribute to burnout. And I think, you know, burnout is so multifactorial. And thank goodness we're at least talking about it now amongst ourselves, because it, it's really something we've got to address or we're going to have no one taking care of our patients uh, in 20 years. I think role of technology, again, I keep harping on workflow, but We've got to empower tech to do what our cell phone does for us. In many ways, it makes our life easier, not more difficult. And we could argue about that, certainly. But if I have to book a flight reservation, I can do it right here. Uh, and many other things. Why isn't our medical tech making our medical lives easier? So I think ultimately, we'll land in a place where it is not contributing to burnout. In fact, it's helping it. And we hope to be able to proliferate that kind of technology through the hospital, the operating room, the med surge ward, the ICUs, even in the pre-hospital <coughs> environment uh, to ensure that the work is done and burnout is less. I'll just take the last comment or question here, if, if I may. It relates to cyber attacks. So the suggestion here is that Ireland's public health sector IT has been crippled for weeks or months by a cyber attack. I can't verify or refute that. Some people may be able to. But the question is pertinent. How resilient can connected health be? Is it, is it subject uh, uh, to the risk of cyber attack? Well, I, I'm going to start with Benny Joe. I was tempted to start with Neil, but Neil, maybe we, we'll end with you. <laughs> but uh, Betty Joe, why don't you take that one? Uh, of course it is, right? I mean, anytime you're opening up that virtual portal um, and discussing those matters, of course, um, you know, the risk is there. But, you know, we're you plan that in your strategy, right? We do a lot of planning and mercy, even around that virtual care center and how much information we're ha housing there. Um, you know, we've been virtual with Epic and, and our technology, so we know how to do this. So I don't think it poses any more risk um, than it does today. It might give those criminals more opportunity to intervene, um, but I don't think it's, it's posing any more significant risk. It, it, we're at high risk as it is. 
John Whittle, what are, what are your thoughts on this? Because you were, you know, leaning into like AI and some of those things, but I mean, this kind of all goes along the same, same, same line here. I mean, again, yeah, as as Petito says, of, of course, there's a risk of cyber attack if you're uh, going online. That is the the biggest elephant in the room about all of this. Um, and you know, the leaning in was, um, of course, yeah, leaning in because I agree. Uh, with Sam that, you know, this is the way that we've got to move as a profession, as a way of delivering health. But all the way through, we do have to think about data security, about contingencies for what happens if if all this goes down, you know, because we would be in trouble, wouldn't we, if everything was hacked. I mean, I think there's been quite a lot published actually about, you know, cyber cyber attacks in health. Uh, there was a Harvard paper a couple of years ago, a paper kept from a group there talking about just this matter. We just did with anyone else, all of our online digital implementation, part of the risk assessment is data security and structural security as well. Sam? It's a, a Medtronic wide initiative, doubling and tripling down on, on cyber security have been for, of course, you know, many, many years, but that issue is, is exploding. And we realize that we, like any other business that is investing in software, that is investing in connectivity, that is buying these platforms, we find value in them and our customers find value in them. And so therefore we're just like every other business. By knowledge, there's no such thing as an unhackable system. It's only a question of how difficult it is. So it is really a constant revision specialty, if you will. And we constantly, like every major corporation, evaluate threats, solve them, and build the mitigations for those threats, future threats, into our devices as well as we can, and then constantly update them. So it is, it's is something that is at the foremost um, concern of the company and our patients and our stakeholders, and something that we, we invest heavily in. Um, and lastly, Neil, just to ask you, and, and not not necessarily the Irish perspective, but from the patient perspective, is this something that's going to inhibit, you know, uptake of technology? I mean, the, the threat of cyber attacks, I feel like all of us have had, you know, data breach and things like that. And uh, it does make one a little leery. Interestingly, um, while, uh, you know, it's a big blow to hear that your national health service has been attacked and the cyber attack uh, had devastating consequences, not only for those working in the system, but for patients. But, you know, I actually believe that, um, I, I, in fact, I'm not aware of, of any circumstance where I've heard of patients uh, say that as a result of this, they have any less confidence in, um, in the system. And, they, and believe you me, in Ireland, there, there are lots of reasons not to have confidence in the healthcare system. But on this particular one, I think there's a realization, as Sam says, that actually there is no data system that is, uh, you know, that you can not penetrate at some point in time. So the question is how you, how you, what steps you take to minimize that and then how you deal with it. So you might automatically assume that because there was this major breach, that patients would be saying, that's it, I'm not going to ever engage in data sharing. That actually didn't happen. So in the last minute, very quick um, closing comment from everyone, Desiree, if you don't mind picking who to go around. I'm just the, the, the real question for me is, does anyone think we're going back to something that looks a bit like pre-COVID? All right, I'm going to start with Imogen, because I'm, one, very interested in your comment. I think I missed you before. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, no, don't worry. Um, no, I don't think we're going back. We're definitely going forward. I think the race is only half what run, and I think we've done it at a sprint, and now we need to sort of slow down and really focus on, you know, what we're doing, making sure it's right for patients, really involving patients in this stage, and then obviously evaluating it. Is is it working? Is it right? Um, to be able to make those adaptions that will be then long-standing, really. I agree with Imogen. I don't think we're going back. I don't think we should go back. You know, embedded telehealth should be part of the future, but I also agree that now we've got our foot in the door, we now need to be careful going forward that we get it right for everyone. And Betty Jo, from your perspective, we've, we've opened this up, so can we go back? <laughs> uh, no, we are, we are not going back. That's 100% sure. We're only going forward. I hope we go forward faster, as fast as we can do it safely. I agree. We're, we're going forward. I think one thing uh, I commend Palm for today is having a patient representative here. And I think as we go forward as a profession, we've got to make sure that our patients are involved and our other stakeholders, our nurses, 
physician extenders, other providers, so that we make workflow easier for us and, be- and care better in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. Very optimistic about the future and about connected health. The question about is the doctor in the future redundant? Absolutely not. The doctor will, will serve a diff- somewhat different function and they're going to be obviously very much involved in data analysis and, and understanding all this data that they're going to have at their disposal. But the key thing here is the human connection and the human interaction. And so even in, on Zoom and things like that, we have to perfect how that happens because patients need that. They need to be able to know that I've made a connection with the healthcare professional I'm speaking to. So it's just learning and a bit more experience. This all came at us, as I said, like a train, a runaway train. So we all need some time to take our breath and to um, you know, take the learnings and progress into a very positive future. Now, I, I know we've run over uh, and uh, some people need to go, but Neil, I just want you to give a very quick shout out that we're both involved in this improve endeavor and there's going to be, uh, this is to improve surgical outcomes in particular. There's going to be a document, I think, released in the European Parliament on the 28th of September. We're sending out a link to it. Uh, and I think somebody locally is, is promoting that as, a, as an MEP that's from this neck of the woods. Just in closing, very briefly. Yes. Yeah, well, I, I, that's, where you, that's where I met you. And again, it was one of those um, fora where you had patients or uh, clinicians and, and patient voice together discussing um, perioperative um, hypotension and uh, the role of predictive monitoring. And I came to that discussion uh, really having not having a clue about, about this space. And uh, clearly, this is something that is very important from a patient point of view. And uh, as you say, uh, the, uh, uh, there was a think tank pulled together to, to explore this and this com- com- come together with some very interesting calls to action. Hopefully these will be launched. Sean Kelly, Irish MEP, will host a launch in the European Parliament. Fantastic. There's a lot of digital in that. So thank you very much. Thank you on this conversation about connectedness. Thank you for connecting with us to all of our panel. Um, I'm glad we could utilize and uh, optimize this technology to have a wonderful conversation. So thank you all very, very much. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. If you check out ebpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home. Check out ebpom.org now.